Ladies and gentlemen, we often think of Wales as, uh, as this small, smart nation. Uh, can we build upon this to create smart cities and towns? Uh, Kinetic are here next to uh, talk about this very subject, so would you please give a warm welcome to Anthony Alston. Anthony. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I think I'm last on, so I'll rush through the 78 slides I've got, and uh, we should be ready by about midnight. Um, there we go. Smart cities. Um, I'm not going to talk about a particular technology. Uh, I'm going to talk about lots of technologies, and I'm not going to look at smart cities from one particular perspective. I'm much more interested in how we can collaborate both those technologies and academia, industry, SMEs, government, in order to be able to achieve the objectives of the, of the smart city concept. I'm quite new to smart cities, so, so like any good analyst, I, I looked it up on Wikipedia. And there are lots and lots of definitions of what smart cities are, um, really as many as, 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 the, as there are definitions within the, on the internet. But where they all really sort of all come together is that there's an agreed set of characteristics, high-level characteristics of what smart cities are trying to achieve. And there they are, all obviously preceded by the word smart. Uh, smart economy, so looking at how we can make our, our cities more prosperous. Smart mobility, in order to be able to increase mobility in, in our cities uh, and regions. Uh, smart environment, making them cleaner uh, and, and uh, more, uh, more livable. Smart people, um, encouraging education and, and making education more available to people. Smart living in ter terms of making our uh, uh, lives more uh, uh, enjoyable to live in the cities. And smart governance, making the, the governance of those areas and those cities uh, um, more open. Another thing that you see when you look at all the uh, definitions of smart cities is that, is that fact there. Um, and that's the big fact that seems to be driving a lot of the smart city initiatives, that by 2050, more than 70% of the global population will be living in urban areas. And again, like a good analyst, I, I didn't believe that, so I, I looked it up. Uh, and actually, th that's correct. But actually, if you look underneath that, that high-level figure, um, what you see is, is actually a much more complex picture than that single figure actually uh, puts out. Um, I've chosen, obviously, chosen, chosen countries that emphasize the point. But you can see, really, depending upon the country you look at, if you look at the UK, for example, um, that achieved 70% in urban areas back in the 50s. Uh, and if you look at the projections, then actually we're going to be looking at more than 90% um, urban population uh, by 2050. Um, and same with the US. And, and that's really where we have an established environments, established cities that have been around for centuries with uh, 19th century and 20th century infrastructures uh, and industries perhaps also um, uh, from that era as well. So um, looking at a, uh, a smart city environment, a smart city concept that is trying to bring those cities into the 21st century from, from really from quite a, uh, um, a legacy background, if you like. There are steady growth environments, um, mainly in, in the Africa uh, region, um, where the, the, there's very low urban populations, and, and it's a steady growth, not, not a dramatic growth, a dramatic move to cities, mainly driven possibly by, by the, the, the lack of money in those areas. And then you have those dramatic growth environments, where um, medium levels of um, uh, urban population, but dramatic increases uh, coming up to the to 2050, and they really fall into two areas. Those that are brand new cities, uh, like the King Abdullah Technical uh, City in, in Saudi, where within a 10-year period, it'll go from zero to two million. Um, but perhaps more, uh, more difficult to, to, to cope with are cities like Manila and Beijing, where already there's great pollution, uh, great um, traffic problems, and yet they are also expecting to see great growth on top of all of that that's already there. Obviously, I want to just look at the established environments, the, the UK environment particularly. And actually, let's look at the figures. Then actually, the 70% the, the urban population is, you could argue, actually isn't really the issue. Um, the real issue is that if you're getting more than 90% of your population in cities, is actually you're depopulating the rural areas. 
And certainly if you look at Wales, that, that's quite stark. Um, th there's great areas in central Wales where the po population density is considerably lower than the rest of England and, and, and uh, some of the more urban areas around the south and the north of, of Wales. So really what we should be looking at is not smart cities, but we should be looking at smart regions. And we should be looking at holistic approaches to how we can benefit uh, both the regions uh, of the, the urban and the rural regions at the same time, rather than just trying to invest in just the urban areas. So, for example, uh, looking at industry. Uh, don't just think about industry as being something that you, you put into the factories and, and, and to the offices in, in city centres. Uh, but look about outsourcing. How can you spread industry around, around a region, uh, support it with different parts supporting each other? How can you use agile workspaces? So home working, how can you make more home working um, more, more available? Agriculture going the other way. Not just think of agriculture as thing that happens in the rural areas, but uh, like they do in Singapore, thinking about vertical farms, using the, 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 the window space in those large skyscrapers to actually grow, uh, to, to grow crops. And to look at the, the supply chains from the local um, rural areas to the, the, the local uh, urban areas and making the supply chains more efficient. Commerce. Um, I think we already heard uh, this afternoon um, about the, uh, uh, the poor service provision in terms of, of uh, mobile uh, coverage in, in, the, uh, in the rural areas. Well, really what we should be looking at is actually supporting those rural areas more because that's actually where um, those uh, online services are most required because there's, there's, no, other, there's, there's no, no other services there. So really what we should be looking at is rather than trying again to boost just the urban uh, uh, service provision, we should look, look into more balanced service provision across both the urban and the rural areas. And another example, energy. Again, perhaps we should always be thinking about the wind turbines, solar panels. We should be looking at how we can actually use the land in the rural areas a bit more to support the land, the energy requirements of those, uh, of those urban areas as well. So what, what does this look like in terms of smart regions? This is just a very small snapshot of some of the things that people are talking about in terms of smart cities and how information can enable cities to be operating smarter. And we've heard a lot of these already today. So in terms of transport, we've heard about apps that tell you where there's a parking space, uh, apps that um, tell you when the next bus or the next train's coming along, um, driverless cars um, and logistics chains, being able to use driverless cars to, to uh, make uh, the traffic actually travel in much more compact, uh, uh, compact uh, volumes uh, so we can actually get more, more traffic through. Uh, in terms of buildings, smart buildings, uh, materials that actually uh, uh, um, react to the, the weather conditions and the environment. Um, uh, again, we talked about agile, agile workspaces, smart buildings that have sensors in them that, that then control the environment within those buildings, uh, Internet of Things that, again, we heard about this afternoon. Energy, we've already talked about saving energy, uh, energy storage in terms of perhaps hydroelectric uh, and, and so on. And all that's underpinned by an information infrastructure, generally where a vast number of sensors uh, sensing um, where the traffic is, what the pollution levels are, where the people are, are, are moving. Built on top of that, the data analytics to identify the trends and hopefully identify triggers of patterns so you can see when, when certain sort of uh, uh, traffic situations are going to occur because you've already seen those trends and those patterns before. Cyber security. Um, what we want to be able to do is to actually use some of this data to actually influence how we, for example, uh, 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 govern the traffic light system. Or we, that, we don't want that to actually be circumvented for, for, for the wrong uses. So cyber security of that data is very, very important. And putting that on open data platforms and computing platforms to allow in the right circumstances people to actually access that and to generate their own applications. And who's going to be using those? Well, actually, it's everybody. It's not just local and, and, and uh, central government. It's large and small businesses. It's communities. It's individuals. It's anybody that can gain access to those open data platforms should be able to access those. But we also need some form of governance process above that. 
Um, top, top, bottom up is, is all very well and good, but we do need some top down visions that, that, that can allow us to uh, value the investment that we're putting into the smart cities. Without that strategy, that vision, we can't decide, we can't build those predictive city region models that allow us to do what if um, uh, uh, exercises on new ideas and innovative ideas that are coming along in order to be able to judge how well they're going to impact and benefit the, the city. Um, intelligent dashboards, in order to be able to, again, look at how the city is performing um, and, and perhaps again identify triggers um, of, of, of patterns of behavior that are uh, uh, contrary to actually what you want. And in terms of sustainability and prosperity, those are the things that we actually want to be able to measure. And again, without some strategy, without some figures that are telling us what we want to try and achieve, then identifying whether we actually are reducing CO2 production, uh, whether we actually are being more mobile, um, is very difficult to measure. So those, those things that, the, uh, again, will need to be built into the predictive city and region models. And we need an operating model for those things. And what I'm just postulating here is a, is a three-stage um, um, operating model for that governance piece. Um, we need to enable innovation. We need to bring together uh, problem owners, solution providers, and funders. We need to bring them together in a collaborative environment so that they can, they can innovate, again, under this strategy, so there's no other direction, they know whether, what sort of value they're going to be uh, enabling in the, in the region. And the benefits there are just the fact that bringing people together to collaborate, no more than that. Out of that, we need, we have funded ideas which we can then put into a creating in innovation environment, a test bed or, or lab environment where we have real city data in a safe environment so you can fail, you can break, and it doesn't matter. Um, um, have links to academia and to, into industrial facilities uh, where we can actually test some of these ideas out in a safe environment. And again, the benefits there, not just the fact that uh, uh, people can come and use that data, but when, when they've done that, they actually have a product that they can actually show, provide some value and what that value is. And then finally, um, applying innovation actually taking those uh, funded solutions and putting them together with the funded infrastructure um, uh, and uh, actually attracting the, the real benefit that, that is to the community, to the users of those smart apps um, and in terms of funding, actually uh, return an investment back to uh, the problem owners and solution providers. And just quickly, uh, some use cases. So a major infrastructure project, for example, the problem owner there would be perhaps local government. And local government would be identifying funding sources in order to be able to build, for example, uh, a broadband, high-speed uh, uh, internet connection within a particular region. For um, technology strategy board funding, again, bringing together people that have got ideas, bringing, bringing them together with, with uh, people who've got the, the problems and helping them put together um, um, proposals for uh, TSB funding and then providing them with a, a lab in which in th they can actually be demonstrated with real data. EU funding perhaps taking that one step further where it's not just the problem providers um, the problem owners and the solution providers, but actually bringing that together with some region who, who, who's actually got the problems and actually wants those uh, um, uh, smart applications um, uh, implemented in their area. And finally, uh, just brokering problems, just bringing people together um, just so that they can uh, um, fund those uh, ideas themselves and just play with them in, in the, in the uh, test bed. So in summary, what we're looking at is this combination of the rural and the urban, uh, a region rather than a smart city, where we have balanced service provision right across those two areas. A governance process above that is providing a regional vision um, and sponsoring innovation and development programs, bidding, bidding, bringing benefits right through from the community in terms of sustain, uh, sustainable living, industry in terms of environments in which it's, it's a, a sustainable working environment, uh, SMEs bringing uh, collaborations and, and bringing them together with people who have got problems and, and have got funds, 
uh, academia, bringing them access to, again, to collaborators, and finally to, to government in terms of greater employment, increased prosperity, but most importantly of, uh, underpinned by uh, value-based uh, uh, development programmes. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.